We're glad you could join us to the first webinar in a series of three on Mediterranean MPAs. These webinars are presented by the Mare Nostrum Network, an international network of NGOs involved in marine conservation around the world. If you are a part of such an organization, please contact us and join us on the network with the email I will post in the chat box shortly. I'm honored to present Giuseppe Di Carlo, a well-known activist in the field of marine protected areas. As the head of, uh, of WWF Mediterranean, Giuseppe will talk about challenges and opportunities around the Mediterranean. During the webinar, you're welcome to type all your questions in the question box and send it to us. We'll have time for, a short question, uh, for short questions uh, in the end of Giuseppe's talk. Giuseppe, please. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks very much, Rodham. It's a really nice opportunity to be able to speak in a series of three. I believe that uh, this is also leading up to the regional MBA forum that will take place towards the end of November in Morocco. That's, a, that's an event that happens every four years. It really brings together a very, very diverse group of, of stakeholders uh, engaged on MBAs. <clears throat> Maybe a couple of things before I start. Um, first of all, why MPAs? Uh, I think it's important, at least to me, uh, why do I believe that MPAs are an important tool for, for ocean protection? Um, and, and I want to say a, a couple of things. First of all, MPAs can really work, and we will see that today. I'll obviously focused on um, demonstrating or showing you case studies of why MPAs work. But MPAs can also be extremely complex. Um, so it's, it's a challenge uh, for ocean protections that, that we like to take. But at the same time, um, in MPAs, or MPAs bring in uh, three very important uh, elements. One is people, uh, the second is the ocean, uh, and the third is the economics. Uh, and often is economy or economics at the local level. So these are three ingredients that are typically uh, those that you need for a good recipe for successful ocean management. Um, and then the Mediterranean. Uh, we'll talk obviously about the Mediterranean today. That it's it's my place. It's where I live, where I work, what I'm excited about. Um, a very complex and challenging environment. Uh, I think uh, for those of you that come from that region in the webinar, you understand the complexity from a sort of a political, religious, uh, social, and and as well as uh, ocean protection uh, perspective. So I will focus the presentation on two main aspects. Today, uh, where we are on MBAs, um, what are the key challenges, and then what are some of the opportunities, or what are some of the evidence that we have that MBAs work. I'm not going to tell you anything uh, particularly new, but at the same time, I want to give you an overview of what's the status of things, uh, what's the state of the art of MPAs, and then sort of where do we look into the future. Um, I think one thing is important uh, to mention, and I'll start with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, obviously, in the global context, the Sustainable Development Goals are, are the new uh, conservation um, framework, uh, especially uh, for the first time the ocean is included uh, in the Sustainable Development Goal 14, SDG 14, Life Below Water, with a number of targets that are uh, specific within that, and two targets actually make specific references reference to marine protected areas. One target makes a reference to marine protected areas as a tool to be able to manage and restore fisheries for livelihoods and for food security. And then one target that is more specific to achieving a 10% of ocean protection by 2020. Now you probably know that as the sort of global context or global ocean management context evolve, um, these targets might change. Uh, now in the new agenda 2030, for sustainable development, we're talking about a 20%, if not a 30% target for ocean protection globally. Now, the majority of the big, big MPAs that a lot of countries um, tend to establish are typically in very remote places with very limited human presence or human interaction. Um, and those places are obviously a little bit easier to some extent to manage and to, and to protect. The real challenge challenges comes in places like the Mediterranean where pretty much 1% of the coastline remains untouched. We have 150 million people living on the coastline. Um, 
leaving off the coastline or the coastal economy, and so it becomes very difficult to set aside uh, areas for, for, for protection. Now, very briefly about MPAs. Um, the MPAs, it, it's a general term, but obviously they go through what we refer to as a life cycle that can take some time. It can take sometimes up to 10 to 15 years from when an MPA is officially established in a law of a country or through international agreements, for example, to when the MPA is actually performing. Now, by performing, we're talking about ecological effects, social effects, and economic effects that are actually benefiting both the marine environment, marine ecosystems, they, the services that they provide and the people that live around it. I'm not going to go through necessarily the, the, the life cycle of MPAs because I want to talk a little bit more about the general context for challenges and opportunities, but I think it's important that we understand the complexity of going from getting an MPAs on paper, which often um, might be the easiest part of the job, to when we actually get MPAs to, to fully function. And to fully function means that needs to be buy-in at a political level and obviously from local stakeholders. Now, again, uh, on the global context, and I, I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that this is a, um, a presentation that is a set of three, uh, together with colleagues from the Meta Network and uh, uh, RAXPA. Um, it's important to say that because today I wanted to offer uh, something that was a little bit more uh, the context of MPAs on, in the, on the ground. Uh, I believe that my colleagues will be talking more about the regional network, where we are on MPAs in the Mediterranean, and then, of course, the challenges of actually managing those. I, I, today I want to present you a little bit of results and evidence of how MPAs work. Now, where we are, I think it's important to make a reference. Uh, you could see on the orange line that this is the global MPA designation. Um, and then you can see on the red line the Mediterranean MPA designation, the current MPA designation. So we're just above 6%, um, not far from the 10% target. But unfortunately, there is a but. There is, there is actually two buts. One is. Um, Part of or half of that percentage is represented by the Pelagos Sanctuary. The Pelagos Sanctuary is a sea mammal uh, sanctuary that was created between Italy, France, and the government of Monaco in 2001-2002 to protect sea mammals. Now, as much as that is a area set aside for sea mammals, it's not an area that is actually uh, managed for, for ocean management. So there is a gap, there is sort of a downfall to the creation of, of the sanctuary. Nevertheless, when we talk about area-based measures, which means that the, the number of tools that are used to protect the, the surface of the ocean, the Pelago Sanctuary obviously accounts for a good percentage. In addition to that, we talk about Natura 2000 sites. Those sites are protected areas that are established under European law. So they obviously uh, are mostly pertinent for uh, EU member states, but that obviously doesn't apply for countries that are not in the EU. And in addition to that, um, those sites are often uh, not managed or not implemented. So we have a 6.5% 6, 6 that you can see on this graphic, but at the same time, a very small portion of this 6.5% is effectively managed. In addition to that, uh, when you look at the sort of light blue uh, bar at the bottom of the graph, that 0.02%, uh, that is actually the percent of no-take areas. These are fully protected areas where no ex non-extractive activity, where no extractive activities, excuse me, are allowed. So the actually fully protection of the Mediterranean uh, marine environment is very, very small. I'm not going to go very much into details uh, on the challenges of uh, the, the, the Mediterranean. Uh, these are very, very diverse, and it's a small sea. I think I, I'm assuming that most people are familiar with it. It's a small sea, semi-enclosed sea, with, like I said, with 150 million people living in it, and 30% of the global maritime traffic coming across it. So 
obviously there is a number of challenges. One thing that I like to flag uh, specifically because there is a lot of talking lately about the development of the renewal of um, concessions for oil and gas extractions in the Mediterranean, uh, it's this map to show that um, in the Adriatic as an example, a lot of the, the MPAs that exist, which are the purple dotted points on the map, um, are very, are in very close proximity with um, existing uh, concessions for oil and gas extractions or oil and gas exploration. So obviously we live in an environment where um, maritime growth or activities at sea are increasing. So the challenges and conflicts of different sectors, including uh, ocean management and protections, are become you know bigger and bigger every day. Now, challenge one, um, I'm going to go through a set of three challenges and three opportunities in this presentation just to give you um, some examples uh, that, of course, are applicable um, pretty much across the board. Uh, it's true that the Mediterranean is very, very diverse true that it, it's, like I said, it's a small sea where the challenges are very similar, and they're very similar from France to Turkey to Lebanon to Algeria. Uh, and so when we talk about marine protected areas, there are very similar processes and very similar difficulties, very similar challenges um, that, we, that we come across uh, in engaging both sort of with stakeholders on the ground and, and the political counterpart. This is a map that is showing you, again, the percentage of uh, protection in each country. There's there's one thing that I want to draw uh, from here in addition to what I showed you before, which is simply the fact that only few countries have a percentage that is, let's say, acceptable, adequate uh, to secure, at least in part, um, protected um, marine ecosystems and ecosystem services. There is a huge part of a uh, huge um, number of those countries that don't have MBAs, that do not have existing MBAs, do not have well-managed MBAs. So there is obviously a bias in the way the MBAs are established and managed across, across the region. Then on the right, you see the um, percentage of MBAs that have a management plan. Now, having a management plan does not necessarily mean that MBAs are well managed. They're actually performing, as I was saying before. But it's certainly a good indicator that MBAs are paving the road towards becoming effectively managed. Let's say that the management plan is, a, is, is your Google map while you're driving. At least it's telling you where you need to go. It might not get you there immediately, but it's a, it's, it's a good tool to be able to get you to, the, to your final destination. Um, the second, one point I want to make, sorry for coming back to, to the slide, um, because here um, I think this also reflects uh, some of the political context in the Mediterranean. Obviously, environment um, is, you know, has a hard time to get in the political agenda of uh, a number of countries. And often there is a perception from sort of the economic sector and the political um, arena that MPAs are an impediment. They're an impediment because obviously they create conflicts with stakeholders. They take fishing grounds from fishermen uh, whom are extremely protective of their fishing grounds and it needs financial resources. And I'm going to go into financial resources next. So I also wanted to show here that we have an issue with being able to spin the wheel to change uh, the argument about uh, MBAs actually working. I think that today it's a time where we're coming out of a phase where MBAs um, were established fairly quickly. I think in the 90s and beyond that, a lot of countries invested in MBAs. And now it's a time that we see a sort of downward trend uh, for political commitment on MBAs. There is obviously an issue with financial resources. Um, and so public funding um, or public spending for environment and then for MBAs is reduced every day. So I'll move to that, and in this graph you see, um, so we're talking about funding actual here, and we're talking about public funding. So on the left-hand side you see um, the projection of GDP growth for EU countries, uh, the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries, and the Balkan countries. Now obviously you have this here, but let's not get into the complexity of GDP growth, which is for another time. Um, this is a graph that um, is provided by the European uh, Union. But the point here is very simple. 
there is very limited um, GDP growth projected for the next 10 to 15 years. This means that public funding continues to be extremely limited and public funding for MPAs uh, or for, for environment and then even less for MPAs continues to be uh, very limited. We know, for those of you that work in the Mediterranean, we know that private sector funding or private agreements or partnership for MPAs in the Mediterranean are very, very uh, rare. Um, there's very few, if any. So the majority of MPAs today in the Mediterranean relies on, on public funding. Here you see on the right hand side, um, on the contrary, you see the amount of funding that is spent every year uh, for MPAs, uh, which you then see sort of the percentage of the needs that that amount covers. Now 53 millions, I think for each one of us, sounds like a lot of money. Um, but when you divide the 53 millions by the uh, 200 plus MPAs, uh, and then you sort of do a calculation of the cost of living per country, you understand that those 53 millions are not a lot of money. Um, that amount is actually, um, and part of that amount actually increase, uh, includes cooperation funding, international agreements funding, uh, NGOs funding, uh, government um, cooperation agencies funding. So actually the real number that public uh, of public spending for MPAs, it's around 35 million per year. Now I want to touch on um, the projection. Um, this is a study that we did last year, um, WWF together with Medban and others, on uh, the financial needs of MPAs. Today we have a projection that to manage existing MPAs, um, so those MPAs that are established today in the law, we would need 700 million a year. Obviously this might be a somewhat inflated number because this study is based mostly on responses that we got from MPA managers and governments. So obviously the desired optimal scenario might not be necessarily what we are shooting for. We might be shooting for something that is actually sustainable. But this number is still very big considering that a few seconds ago we were talking about 53 million investment a year, having to scale it up to 700 million a year. Um, so obviously there's a huge financial gap between uh, the needs and the available resources. In addition to that, um, imagine if we had to create a projection. Today we said we are 6.5. Imagine if we had to scale up to the 10% uh, IEG target um, projection, which is 10% of the Mediterranean. This actually goes up of one order of magnitude, so from 700 million to 7 billion. So obviously these are huge numbers, but this gives us an idea, you know, if we take this with a grain of salt, um, this gives us an idea on where we are with funding today. So. Obviously, so to go back to the two challenges so far, there's an issue with political commitment. There's an issue with political commitment from some of the from some of the countries. I understand that we live in a, a very complex time where obviously there are other priorities. That's something that shouldn't be neglected. Um, but at the same time, we understand that the the effort that we're making at the regional level is just insufficient to be able to guarantee um, ocean management and, and the protection of ecosystems to a level that is sufficient. The third challenge, and I apologize for the mistake, I say second, it should say third, is enforcement. Uh, we know, again, because we have scientific evidence, that there is a huge difference in the effects that, uh, ecological effects that MPAs produce uh, when they are well enforced, when they are weakly enforced, and then, of course, when they are not enforced or in sites are unprotected. This is a graph that you see on the bottom that comes from, from a study uh, that demonstrates the effects on enforcement on large predators and then other species. And you can see very clearly the difference in biomass um, per meter square on the left hand side, well enforced MPAs. And here what's striking, in addition, if you look only the, the, the red part, is that in well enforced MPAs, you have more predators, which means you have more healthy cas uh, trophic cascades, uh, more healthy uh, biological and ecological, and ecological interactions, and most likely you have a stronger um, spillover effects, which means that 
the no-take zones, the fully protected areas are actually benefiting places beyond, uh, beyond their borders. Here, I don't want to get into the dynamics of enforcement, but I will mention uh, one thing, which I think is extremely important, which is um, the instruments, the tools that we have for enforcement. Again, those are very, very different across the board uh, from countries that have uh, MPA enforcement at sea that allow for rangers to be placed and to be operating within MPAs. These are obviously local police force that is performing, that is dedicated uh, with resources forces and staff and training um, to MPAs, to enforcing MPAs, to avoid uh, illegal activities. Um, and then other systems, I can cite Italy, for example, is, 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 is a good one, uh, where the Coast Guard, which is obviously as a national uh, police force, has uh, the authority or is empowered to do monitoring and surveillance within MPAs. This means that there is not a real accountability of enforcement and patrol um, units to the MPA management. That's obviously a disconnect that exists in the structure of the law that often doesn't allow to, uh, MPAs to have a system that is actually adequately uh, performing enforcement. Now, to move on, um, MPAs work. Uh, and this is uh, with exclamation point because uh, for a long time we've had this discussion about the fact that we really needed to demonstrate that MPAs are delivering economic benefits. That we had to change the argument, we had to change the discussion, we had to rephrase uh, the way we spoke to politicians uh, to be able to tell them that MPAs are actually delivering economic benefits. Well, I think that argument today is made, the argument is proved, so we know that MPAs, when they work, when there is commitment, when there is funding, when there is capacity, when there is um, training, they can deliver benefits. And let me go through um, a couple of, uh, of examples. This is a slide um, that shows, this is, this is interesting because this shows the perception of fishermen uh, at the onset of the MBAs and then five years later regarding the MBAs in the Taza National Park in Algeria. So here you have what fishermen thought that the benefits are the, the benefits that MBAs could deliver in terms of biological resources, in, to, in terms of well-being for the local community, in terms of income for fishing, and then, and then income for tourism. And you can see that the response changes dramatically uh, in a five-year time. And to make a link back, to track back to what we were saying about the life cycles of MBAs, um, this is exactly what I mean. Sometimes this life cycle is spread across some time where you need, that, that is needed um, for MPAs to be able to engage the community, to engage the stakeholders, to demonstrate that they're not just setting aside um, pieces of the, of the sea uh, and they are blocked out uh, from any activity. There is fishing ground that today is no longer available for the fishermen. No, this is a, this is a discussion and engagement and buy-in of the fishermen to understand that with few simple rules, with few simple um, sharing of decision making, of approaches, of management decisions that can be taken together uh, that, that we can come to results. This sometimes, when I, when I talk to governments, uh, sounds like very NGO talk. Oh, let's get together, let's do stakeholder engagement, this is what NGOs do. Well, that might well be what NGOs do. I understand that sometimes it's very complex for governments to conduct lengthy stakeholder processes, but the truth is there is no other way around it. If we don't come to a common understanding of why the MPA is there and what can deliver to each and everyone living in and around, we're never going to overcome the, 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 the conflicts. In terms of um, ecological benefits, um, again, I wanted to show you this from um, a paper that is in preparation. You can see the average change in biomass and density from fully protected areas, so like I said, no tech zones, the two terms sometimes are used um, in different contexts, and then partially protected areas. And again, there is a huge difference in change. So you have 420% change um, in a in fish biomass compared to outside. So 
and we have this data for a number of MPAs in demand. Now, unfortunately, we don't have this data for all the MPAs in demand. Uh, I wish, that would be sort of a dream, uh, but we do have sufficient data to be able to demonstrate that this happens, and this happens in a time span of four to six years. So it's not also huge investment. The return of investment in establishing is actually uh, fairly good. Uh, if you think that, imagine that you were investing a million euros and in four years you were getting four times the amount. That's a pretty good investment. Um, this is instead a paper um, by Guidetti that was uh, published in 2015, and this actually shows, to try to keep it simple, because I understand there is a lot of uh, uh, symbols in the slides, this really shows the key elements uh, that um, allow the MPAs to be successful, to be able to deliver, uh, to be able to perform appropriately. And so if you look from the top, enforcement is the number one. So I was mentioning that because you can have, you, you could do all your checks. You could say, I established the MPAs with the right, the right parameters that takes into account connectivity, that takes into account uh, ecosystem services that is representative of the different habitats. Um, I have engaged the stakeholders, we work together, we make decisions but then everybody does what they want. People are coming from outside, people are poaching, some people are night fishing and poaching, that obviously that's not gonna help, that's not gonna deliver benefits. So enforcement still remains the number one. Interestingly, interestingly the number two element is fisherman engagement. Um, I don't know how many of you work with fishermen, but you, I think, understand that it's uh, a category of people that have traditionally fished for centuries. I mean, one thing that really str um, struck me when I worked in MPAs is how stubborn fishermen are. I mean, they retire and they keep fishing. And now I know a fisherman that is 78 years old and his brother is 83 years old, and every day they go out together. And every month they say, "Well, you're going to retire," and then the next month out, they're at sea. So they are they are really attached. They are really embedded into uh, the fishing tradition. But buying them in, convincing them, having them alongside means that you can get to, to a successful outcome. And then um, we can take it a step forward, and we'll talk about that in a minute, which is having the presence of fishermen in the MPA management. Whether that's official, whether it's unofficial, whether that's uh, written in the law, whether it's not written in the law, that's details. Um, what we tend to think is that co-management, which is shared management among stakeholders, uh, is probably the most successful approach uh, to MPAs. Um, and then we come down, but I wanted to show that these are key aspects to demonstrate that if you do your checks, if you do, uh, if you have the right approaches, you always come to, to a successful outcome. Um, and we touched upon um, MPAs being able to deliver triple bottom line benefits. Uh, triple bottom line benefits include obviously uh, benefits, uh, economic benefits and social benefits. Um, and this is why I really like MPAs because you have these three elements, and you have them in a context that is uh, in a territory that is fairly limited, that is defined and with a clear authority, and, and a clear authority that has the capacity to engage, uh, to talk, to demonstrate the value of ocean protection. This is why I sometimes I, I get a bit frustrated because I think that MPAs and managing MPAs is extremely simple. Um, until you bring the people in. And then, obviously, when you add the human element, uh, we as humans tend to make our lives um, a little bit more complicated than we really should. Um, but it can work, and I think this is what is what, what is exciting. And this is, on one end, is exciting. On the other hand, it's frustrating that we still are advancing at uh, very small steps. This is, uh, I wanted to mention this again, some pretty big numbers and in US dollars. Um, I don't know how many of you um, can work in US dollars, but um, this is a study that WWF uh, published in 2015 about uh, the economic benefits of MPAs. This is obviously uh, a global study with global numbers. Um, and again, I want to keep it extremely simple. The point is there's a huge return, return of investment in, in uh, establishing MPAs um, with, with huge net benefits. 
up to billions of euros uh, for so and I think the ratio is one to three I'm not sure that it's in this slide but the ratio is one to three if you invest one you get three and you get three in a time span that it's not so big so um, when you look at it at a global scale and you talk about economy and you think about the ocean um, as one of the global economies um, and then this was a study uh, published by WWF that talked about the ocean as being the seventh uh, economies in the world uh, because of the ecosystem services that, that, that it provide. So imagine that you were a bank and you wanted to protect your assets. Most likely you will want to be establishing MBAs to protect your ass assets to be able to get an interest rate that's three times higher than what you had invested. This might seem again very big but this is a good argument when you're talking to people that understand numbers. And this is a good, good argument when we try to understand what is that the ocean uh, is provided to us. Then you have the US dollars on the left hand side, but then you have a beautiful uh, beach in Turkey on the right hand side, just to compensate the, 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 uh, the difference. Um, and then I'll go through uh, three um, opportunities. Um, first one, again, I made a mistake. Um, the first one is uh, Medes, uh, Medes Islands in, in Spain. Uh, this is a bit of a classic, but again, um, I wanted to diversify the, the case studies that I used, and I, there are data for a number of MPAs in the Mediterranean that demonstrate the economic benefits of MPAs. Here, the math is very simple. Um, there is a there is a MPAs that work. There is a reserve effect that works uh, because it you know for for a long time the MPAs has been well managed and well enforced. You obviously have fish like this grouper here in the photo uh, that are you know reprodu reproducing at a rate that you have uh, tens and uh, plus of these individuals. So obviously this is attracting the diving tourists uh, tourism and the MPAs is generating 5.9 nine million from tourism a year. That's a huge number. Now, if you skip the middle part and you get to the last sentence, you understand that the government is investing 0.44 million a year with a return of investment of 5.9. So that's obviously huge. Um, and we're talking about uh, scuba diving with about 70,000 uh, dives a year being performed in the MPAs. Obviously, this is one of the most famous cases, but there is many. There is Tavolara there in, in Italy, there is Porcro in France, and there is uh, Scandola in, uh, in Corsica. To some extent, there is uh, MPAs in Turkey, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have these examples, and nobody is preventing us to have to, to export this model to somewhere in Tunisia or to somewhere in Lebanon. It's just that there we haven't got to a, to, to a phase yet uh, where we can demonstrate the, the ecological first and then the economic benefits. Obviously, in all of this, um, something that people sometimes uh, forget is that divers um, generally tend to eat at the end of the day, um, and sometimes they bring family, and sometimes they will go visit the local museum, and sometimes they will rent a boat, and then they will go to the beach, and then in the evening they will eat to the restaurant. So obviously there is um, a economic wheel around the MPA that is much bigger of what we see. Difficult to calculate and, is, and to some extent that's something that we often wish uh, to be able to do. Um, but the economic return of MPA is when you have an attraction that in this case is diving tourism, is groupers or whatever other fish you have, it's huge. Um, and, and again, this is, this is hard data. This is uh, something that we have available. Then I wanted to talk about um, a, a slightly different example. This is um, in again in Taza National Park in Algeria. It's obviously a very different context to an MPAs in in the in a European countries. This is uh, in Algeria uh, in North Africa, and here the process uh, is a little different. But I think it's really interesting because uh, a here there was a strong political commitment from the park authority to turn the MPA into something that is functional that is performing, that is providing benefits, um, but they actually had the vision to go beyond that. Um, and they worked with WWF for a number of years to be able to overcome the conflicts, to be able to approach the fishermen, to be able to approach a number of different uh, political and government authorities uh, to a point that um, it did take seven years, it says here, seven years. Um, 
but we come to a point that the MPAs not only is um, actually improving uh, its reserve effect, but it's also creating new jobs. Uh, because slowly, through discussions, through meetings, through trainings, uh, through creating a trust, creating a buy-in from the stakeholders at the local level, people started to see what the MPAs is, was about. People started to think, oh, what if we open a diving club? Or then what if we open two diving clubs? Or what if we open eight diving clubs? And then people starting to be one and certified. Nobody was certified to the local level in, uh, in diving, something that maybe for some of us is a bit obvious. Um, and then they saw, oh, wait a minute, people are going diving. Why don't we buy a shop? So why don't we open a shop so that people can buy stuff? And so they opened four diving shops. Um, and then there was a discussion on um, diversifying. Let's not all go diving. We have the fishermen, and we need to be able to provide to the fishermen an alternative uh, opportunity if they're going to rest uh, the nets for some time so that the fish can, can, retreat, can uh, recuperate. Um, and so there was a lot of investment in developing something that is fishermen taking tourists out. Um, this is obviously not international tourists. This is national tourists for the, for the majority. But at the same time, Daza does receive thousands of people every summer. It's one of the most popular destinations in Algeria. So we're talking about huge numbers of people um, that the fishermen might have the opportunity to take out at sea. And that required that actually um, the license system for the fishermen to be able to take tourists on the boat needed to be created from scratch. That simply didn't exist in Algeria. So we also worked with the MPAs to be able to create the licensing system to the point that the law was finally um, developed and implemented in Algeria. So this is the power of a single MPA that has the capacity to change the law at the national level. I think this is amazing uh, in, a, in, in a country like Algeria. Now, the coolest thing about this case study is that the MPA doesn't even exist yet. Um, what I mean is the MPA at sea is not established in the law. But nonetheless, there is a national park on land, and the national park said, well, we want to protect this part of the ocean, and eventually we will create the MPA, but we're not going to wait for the political process to create the MPA. That's way too long. So are we going to go ahead and pretend that we're managing it? Now, that, that makes sense to me, because if a community decides to manage uh, the sea around its municipality or around its uh, coastline, you don't need a law to manage it. You just need stakeholders by in. You just need people to agree on the process and to set the rules, obviously. Um, and we talked about enforcement. We didn't talk about compliance. But if you have a stakeholders by in, if you have people that um, understand the value of what the MPA is providing, you might have compliance to the regulations. You might not need, or you might need to have somewhat reduced investment in enforcement. And then the last case study, so that I can come to an end, um, is that Ottore Quaceto in Italy. This is a cool case study because this is about um, benefits for the fishermen from fishing. I'm not going to go through the process because, again, this was a fairly long process. Um, but at the, and at the same time, with a limited number of fishermen, things might become more challenging when you have 20, 50, 100 fishermen you need to meet uh, every day easier to do with seven, I understand that. Uh, but to some extent, this is a demonstration that um, things might work. So um, here what was done was it was created a process of building trust with the fishermen. Um, it was created a process, <clears throat> excuse me, a process where fishermen were allowed to be part of management decisions, where fishermen were engaged in deciding on how uh, fisheries uh, resources should be protected. And they come to the understanding that they would fish in the MPA only one day a week. Um, one, way, one day a week on a rotation system that in a matter of three, four, five years, it brought to a biomass increase in the fish of four times. Uh, this means that the ratio uh, of price size obviously increased. They were selling much bigger fish at the same price, but they were fishing less. I hope it makes sense. They're fishing less days, they're catching bigger fish, 
and they're, they're, they're maintaining the price. This means that in the end, they will come home at the end of the day with one fishing day in the MPA, instead of 300 euros per day, which were they were making with small fish a number of years ago, today they come home with a thousand euros on the boat. And this was, a, again, very, very simple process, because all they let, all they did was, let's sit at the table, let's create trust with the fishermen, let's go out with them every day, let's record what they do, let's talk to them, let's go and have a coffee, let's go and have a lunch, let's demonstrate that we're here for the long run, and this is where the MPAs, I think, uh, made the difference, the people that are managing the MPAs. They were, they, they were locals, they lived there, they were there for the long run. Um, and they proved that to the fishermen, and so that they could come to a system where they agreed on, um, on, on a number of days at sea. And then they went beyond. They said, okay, you're going to fish less, so we're going to help you to compensate. What we're going to do is when they, we're going to invest in transforming uh, and improving the product once uh, it reaches land. So we're going to start uh, canning the fish, we're going to start labeling the fish, we're going to start creating high quality uh, market for the fish, um, and they try to work towards the certification of slow food, uh, which in Italy, I mean, it's, it's, it's a global label, but in Italy, it's, it was born in Italy, it's obviously more developed in Italy, it's a certification of sustainability, local products, um, that generally um, um, prove that the fish comes from, from a local sustainable source. That actually increases the value of the price when it's not sold locally, but it's sold elsewhere with a label, slow food, that is two to three times higher. Okay, um, I'm going to come to an end. Um, I just, I think I talked enough about um, the need to engage people. And I wanted to pass this message because we often refer at, as, uh, to MPAs as laboratories. And they're laboratories because they give us the opportunity to test um, ocean management. Um, and a lot of the things that we try to do is to get people to talk, to get fishermen to talk to fishermen, to get tourist operators to talk to tourist operators, to get authorities to talk to authorities. Um, and we also invest a lot in training, in capacity building, in sharing, in planning together. Um, and again, uh, we need to be able to um, invest uh, in MPAs to make them work, and not just invest in funding, sometimes invest in creating the right conditions, the more fertile conditions for all stakeholders to thrive. Um, and just maybe one message about the future, uh, because like I said in the beginning, uh, it, it's, a, it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time to convince governments to invest in MBAs. Uh, to some extent, the priorities, like I said, are elsewhere. To some extent, there is no public funding, so why should we establish new MBAs when really we don't have enough money for the ones that we have? So obviously, this is not a good time to push for ocean protection. But at the same time, we're seeing a global movement, and we talked at the beginning uh, about the Sustainable Development Goal, that is certainly acknowledging the benefits that the ocean provides. So I guess the message is that we are at a time that it's particularly challenging, um, but at the same time, there is no coming back. There is no stopping. There is no uh, halting uh, or being satisfied with, with what we have. Here, the key is to be able to continue to work locally, because this is where we make the difference. Um, it's very nice and very important to be in global discussions. It's very important to be in a global setting, uh, to be able to engage governments at the global level. See, for example, what happened at um, COP21, at the climate COP21. This is an amazing, outstanding result. But then, we need to be able to translate it locally, and this is where we need uh, all the help we can get in being able to work together to advance MPAs. So I'll stop here. Um, thanks very much. I went a few minutes longer, but um, I hope this was useful. Thank you, Giuseppe, so much. This was fascinating. And uh, we just have a few questions. Um, first, and this is how you ended your talk, uh, the local initiatives and and uh, the, the small NGOs looking to protect their own beaches. So you were really thrilled of what we have to do once we have an MPA, but how would you recommend to start promoting such an MPA if you're a tiny local initiative just in love in your own beach and wanting to get the authorities to recognize that? 
Well, we have seen a lot of these initiatives coming out lately, and and these initiatives come from the recognition that the ocean is in bad shape. And in the last few years, I've had the chance uh, and the opportunity to talk to uh, diving clubs in Malta, for example, that wanted to get together and establish an MBA because they wanted to improve their business, um, or small fishermen organizations that were saying, "Well, we don't have any more fish, so." We might as well go create an MPA and let the, let the sea recover. So uh, I think that we're often stuck into the formal process of MPAs. Um, I understand that in the Mediterranean we don't have the privilege of community-based rights, which you have elsewhere in the world where communities can pretty much manage their own resources. But at the same time, I think we shouldn't be discouraged. I think we need to be able to, uh, like I said, engage fishermen. Um, I have seen people, even private individuals on small islands in Greece. I have a friend that is trying to get an MBA up and running. They didn't go through the formal process. The first thing he did is, we, I'm going to sit with the fishermen. We're going to create, we're going to design a process, we're going to design an MPA together. And then, when we are a single voice, we're going to go to the government. And honestly, I've seen that process sometimes working better than the opposite. Because I have seen the government going to stakeholders and saying, hey, we, we're going to create an MPA here, and then it takes 10 years to convince people. So um, I think, and, and you mentioned NGOs, and, and I think that NGOs sometimes, I mean, I'm an NGO, so I'm biased here, but um, I do think that NGOs sometimes have the capacity to move things um, a little bit faster, to be more dynamic, to be able to have good, good credibility at the local level, to be able to uh, work as enzymes, if you allow me, between communities and governments. And so I think there's a huge power in NGOs in overcoming political processes that are often um, time-staking and, and, and frustrating. They're necessary, but at the same time, uh, we can work around it. And I mean, we, we have seen example like that. So I would certainly think that starting uh, to engage stakeholders to create a vision, it's probably the best, uh, the best start. Amazing. Thank you so much. And um, also, I was wondering, um, we hear about um, a lot of initiatives working with fishermen, but uh, Wait, but some fishermen uh, are not um, fully one-minded. So we have the fishermen that are working with us, and then the fishermen that aren't. And we're wondering what were you, what exactly were you meaning when you said uh, to involve the actual fishermen in the management of the of the MPA? How do you practice that? Well. In, in my work, and this goes for my team too, <laughs> although I shouldn't still say that, um, but I like the theory of the willing. Um, I think that, and Torre Guachetto was a case uh, like that. Uh, they started to work with those fishermen that were willing to work with the MPAs, and then with the MPA, and then it turned out that that worked, and then the fishermen that were skeptical in the beginning of the process were actually quite upset that were in part of the of the whole process. They weren't allowed to fish in the MPA because they decided not to be part uh, of the process from the beginning. So I think that peer-to-peer um, -peer and demonstrating um, or having champions uh, is, is a good approach. Um, at WWF, we have promoted a lot of exchanges um, between, among fishermen, uh, bringing fishermen from uh, Croatia to Italy, from Turkey to elsewhere. Um, and, and when you have a good uh, case study, when you have a good example, when you have a model uh, that the fishermen can speak uh, for themselves to other fishermen, um, that generally works. The fishermen are convinced, and we have seen that working. Um, um, and that was amazing because you have fishermen sitting together and having a coffee, speaking different languages, and all of a sudden it's, you know, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but it's like magic. I mean, at some point, I'll tell you this, I spent 30 seconds, um, we were talking to Italian fishermen and Croatian fishermen, and they started to talk about the price of gasoline, my engine is like this, and my net is like this, and all 
uh, I did was to actually serve them coffee because that was all I could do because they were connecting. It was happening. Um, so peer-to-peer uh, -peer and exchanges, um, it, it's definitely a good way to, to demonstrate that um, the things work. And this is why we've been trying to develop a few uh, models that we hope that replicate, by replication we'll be able to create um, more uh, better managed MBAs in the future. Thank you. Okay, now for Sue's question. When you say that MPA work uh, is successful, how do you how do you measure that? And how how would you define a successful MPA? Okay, um, well, there's two answers to this. Um, a whole manual about MBA effect management effectiveness. So um, you can go through sort of the the checks uh, and the indicators and um, the process, uh, which is available, and that's something that we worked uh, on with a number of partners. Uh, which I think it's it's a good tool and it needs to be used, especially by MBA managers, because I find that often people. Um, reference uh, MPA managers managers reference themselves by saying oh my MPA work well let's see about that uh, let's see if it really works let's see if it's really delivering uh, benefits um, and then it's very simple um, there needs to be monitoring there needs to be monitoring at sea and there needs to be monitoring uh, on land I'm talking about mostly socioeconomic monitoring um, and then we need to be able to see how the system changes over time I mean if we look if we speak from a biological ecological perspective you will see changes in the environment it's as simple as that and this is what we refer as um, ecological benefits you will change you will see the changes in predators in new more species new species more density more more biomass, uh, more apex predators, um, and then obviously distance because once uh, not a zone so fully protected areas are re recovered, then the spillover effect will start moving this, this biomass outside. Um, and sometimes this biomass um, can get very far. Um, so obviously there is a whole um, number of studies that are available in uh, assessing uh, ecological benefits. Um, and then there is the economic benefits, and we've seen uh, a case study for both for Metis and, and um, Torre Guaceto. Um, and there, beyond, beyond, uh, behind that, sorry, there is a number of studies uh, through questions understanding uh, price of first sale of first, first sale of the fish of understanding how you know catch per unit effort that uh, the, the fishermen uh, were performing there's all sorts of ways and then there are management indicators I mean do you have a management plan do you have staff do you have resources do you have boats do you have computers I mean there is a number of things that also demonstrating that you need to be equipped to do your job I mean I might come to the office every day and have the best ideas in the world but if I don't have a computer or something I can't talk to anybody I can't meet with anybody I can't exchange with the rest of the world so you obviously need to be able to managing with resources and your management needs to be performing adequately this is where the management plan is something that we believe is important because it's it's a bit the guidebook it's a bit the bible if you wish of 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 the MBA it sets the vision uh, it sets the objectives that you want to obtain and it tells you the indicators that you should use to be able to, to achieve those objectives it's important to know that because it's important to have checks and balances of how you're managing and this is often what we refer as adaptive management if in a year time two years time your MBA isn't performing with the management approaches that you implemented well then you need to be able to change um, the way you do things uh, and it's important you have a document that it's guiding you through that process. Perfect, thank you. Now we have a few questions about the case study of uh, Tata NP. Um, first of all, <laughs> everyone were really bothered about the fact that it's not a declared MPA. So, uh, Francis uh, wants to know that uh, is the creation of the MPA should it affect a uh, new touristy activity, new zoning of the MPA, and new restrictions, obviously. And also, same question, uh, he was wondering if the fishermen are also involved in the diving activities. Okay. Um, in terms of the establishment of the MBA, so the gazetting of the MBA in the law, 
um, that's 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 a political issue and it's a political process um, but it's somewhat complex in the Algerian law um, and so that's where the blockage uh, is at this time so I wouldn't I wouldn't focus on that uh, because that's that's something that we are trying to work uh, for, uh, but at the same time, it's never really stopped um, anybody from from continuing to to invest in in Taza. That zoning of the MPAs, all of the MPA was actually done um, with our support, but it was done by. Tazo National Park sitting um, with stakeholders, going through uh, a multi-stakeholder process so that uh, the fishermen were uh, working with the MPA authorities to establish no take zones and fishing zones. So there is, I, don't, I didn't put it on, but we have a zoning map for um, or zoning plan for Taza that is pretty much approved by the park authority and the stakeholders. Um, so that's that's something that is there, um, and the fishermen were involved in that process. Um, I don't think that the fishermen are involved in diving. I could be wrong. Um, I think that um, the old diving club was a number of people that lived in the community or they were uh, somewhat um, collaborating with the park that saw the opportunity to be able to start establishing diving centers to become certified and to establish small businesses. Obviously, the MPA really helped because the MPA uh, funded the development of underwater trails. Uh, the MPA was promoting a national um, uh, yearly photo uh, underwater photography competition. So there were things that were obviously stimulating, they were obviously facilitating um, the, the interest of local people in, in approaching themselves to, to diving activities. Um, and then the fishermen process and, and, and what we do with the fishermen to be able to uh, develop this tourism approach where the fishermen can take tourists to, demo, to, to show what they do, how they fish, what's their profession, what's their tradition. That's something that is developed in a, in a lot of places in, in, in the MED. Um, and it's something that can work really well. Um, and it, it provides fishermen an opportunity to do something different. Um, and we're talking about countries um, yeah, in Algeria and in other places where obviously um, livelihood development is important, is still important. There is a lot of subsistence fisheries um, and, and we, we often don't think about that. Interesting. Okay, last question. Um, do you know if there was any progress related to the Mediterranean Trust Fund launched by the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation a few years ago? That's a million dollar question to close the webinar. <laughs> That's how we roll. Okay, well, I'll take the challenge. Um, okay, uh, to keep it very brief, um, you might have seen um, that the trust fund was listed um, in the commitment that came out from the Our Ocean Conference that was organized by uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, uh, last um, mid-September, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a conference that happens, uh, that's happened twice already, um, and actually that we will have, that we will host in the Mediterranean next year. Um, this conference is set to create new commitments for the ocean. Um, obviously, the U.S. Uh, was the big winner this year with the biggest uh, MPA in the world with the Hawaiian uh, Monument, National monument uh, and the trust fund is listed among the uh, commitment uh, for the Mediterranean. It's it's a complex process. The WWF is involved in that process together with, with several other uh, friends and, and partners but it's a complex process and it's a complex process for two reasons. Uh, one, a trust fund um, requires uh, uh, a, a well-established governance and financial mechanism uh, which is easier said than done. Um, because uh, to be able to meet uh, the needs of MPAs, we saw earlier in the presentation that we were talking about 700 million and we we're talking 7 billion, so some big numbers. So the, the question that we're trying to ask ourselves is where do we raise this funding from? Uh, there's obviously no, nobody uh, sort of lining up behind the door saying, here, we give you 7 billion. Um, and we're trying to slowly uh, engage governments in being able to uh, commit to be able to support or at least match the trust fund. The trust fund is not just a mechanism to have funding. The trust fund is also a mechanism to engage 
governments uh, to achieve targets together. Many of the trust funds in the world uh, work on a match, matching base. So the trust fund puts one, the government puts one, uh, one dollar, one euro. So obviously the governance and the financial mechanism of the trust fund is important. Um, and then the other uh, issue is um, how does the trust fund actually engage with MPAs? So to answer to the question, because I don't want to go um, around it too long, um, we are in a process of assessing scenarios, uh, financial scenarios and governance scenarios for the trust fund. My hope is that we will have that between now and the beginning of the new year. Um, there will be a discussion about the trust fund at the regional MPA forum in, uh, in Morocco the last week of November. Um, so things are progressing slowly, uh, but like I said, it's, it's a complex process and it's not, not going to happen overnight. Hopefully, sorry, just, just one last thing. Hopefully when we get to it, if we get to it, it's something that, we, that can create sort of a long-term um, um, opportunity for MBA. So it might be, again, it might be worth the time. Okay. Thank you so much, Zosetta. This was fascinating and uh, I've, personally I've learned a lot. So really thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give the webinar. And uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully to see uh, the people, some of the people here at the forum in, uh, in Morocco. Hopefully we will. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. And I'm happy, obviously, you can provide my email. I'm happy to answer questions outside the webinar. Okay. Of course, I will. Thank you All very right. much. Thanks very much. Have a good